Madam President. The Senator from Alaska. Madam President, are we in a quorum call? Yes, we are. Uh, if we could have the quorum call vacated, please. Without objection. Madam President, I've come to the floor a couple times and talked many times to my constituents back home in Alaska about the importance of ensuring that we have a balanced approach, how we deal with this incredible debt crisis that we're in, how we manage to create some certainty, not only for today, but into the years to come. We wanted to make sure not only did we create certainty, but we also did what we can to protect the working families, honoring our commitment to seniors and veterans, and letting our small businesses know that we stand behind them, we want them to be successful, and we want them to create some certainty out there so they can expand their operations and opportunity. You know, I, as I'm sitting here in Washington, D.C., and it's whatever temperature it is outside right now, probably close to 100, maybe 80, 90 percent humidity, sometimes I think maybe we could have got this done quicker if we just turned the air conditioning off in these buildings and uh, probably would have got better results quicker. Uh, but we are where we are. We're in the last 24 hours or so before we have to make a decision what's, what to do with the proposals, the solutions that have been presented. You know, I'm here, and uh, I wish I was home, to be very frank with you, this last weekend. Uh, my son was celebrating his ninth birthday, and uh, as a parent, you know, every birthday is huge and makes a difference. I know, you know, my, the presiding officer knows that very well. So while I'm here, they were enjoying life. Uh, made me think about a lot, and I'm going to put this poster up because I think this is a great poster. I got this text to me during a committee meeting. This is my son who's just turned nine with a real fish. Uh, those that can't see it, it's the same height as he is. He caught this fish with his mother uh, a few days ago. You know, it's a 40-pounder king salmon. It's what we call real fish. And uh, we would consider this also small in comparison to some others we catch. But why, when I got this text, and that's what's so great about technology today, you, he's on, you know, he sends me little notes and little comments during meetings and wants to make sure that I'm connected to what he's doing back there. But this debate that we're having, this moment in time to figure out where we're going is about the Jacobs and the others of his age and not even born today, what we're going to do. You know, we, we're here, presiding officer and I have already experienced many years of our life and what we've already enjoyed and hopefully enjoy more, but really it's about uh, Jacob and others, many of the kids that when I go back home, I get a chance to talk with them, uh, and I'm sure the presiding officer has done it where you go into an elementary school or preschool, you, and I know you were a teacher in Sunday preschool, uh, and you go in there and you have conversations with them and you talk with them and they tell you uh, in their own way, which is sometimes uh, very brutally honest about what they think of what's going on. And I'll, I'll say a quote here in a second. My son said to me, uh, not that he understands everything we're doing, but understands that it is an intense time here because I'm not home, I'm not with him, so he knows it's important what we're doing here. So as we sit here and debate this solution, what's the next step? You know, is it a perfect solution? No. Does it have some issues that I'm still concerned about? Yes. But does it move us down a path to start dealing with the spending, the deficit, the debt, creating certainty, protecting those that need protection and such as our seniors and our veterans? Yes. This proposal produces about a $1 trillion down payment on our deficit and debt. It lays out a process that we could achieve another $1.5 trillion in debt reduction if this joint committee can come back with a proposal. But in the process of all this, it will create certainty into the marketplace. It will create certainty for all of us to know that a small business person who's been thinking about Expanding their business can do that because the markets will respond positively. 
It will create certainty to the individual who maybe was thinking about buying a house or buying a car because now there's stable rates. For those that are putting money aside for education for their young family, us putting money aside for Jacob for his college, know now that the markets are safer, the bonds we invest in are safer, and that the market is better and that his future is a little bit more secure if we do the right thing over the next 24 hours. But still knowing that it's not the perfect deal. It's evenly split between discretionary, cutting half in discretionary, and half in Pentagon waste. Still ensuring that we are a secure nation in protecting our defenses, but cutting what I would consider opportunities within the Pentagon to reduce. You know, as we sit here today and I think about Jacob's future and where he could be and all the kids that I see back home, there's enormous amount of opportunities. Or the pages that are sitting here in this room. Or the kids that are here during the summer running around Washington, D.C. and seeing these great monuments. That's what we're here to do for this generation and future generations. That's our task making decisions based on that, not on what our next election cycle will be. Should we get elected? Should we not get elected? Will this look good on a brochure? Will this not look good on a brochure? Those that plan that, kind of th or have that kind of thinking, are not about this country, are not supporting what this country is all about. You know, I think about all the issues that are in front of us. There's no more critical issue that, at least in my last three years, almost three years now, that I've had to deal with. Is there a component missing in this deal, in this solution? Yes. We're not dealing with the millionaires and billionaires' tax cuts they received and benefited from when they really didn't need it. We're not dealing with the loopholes, the, the, the scams and shams that people have taken advantage of within our tax structure. We haven't resolved the question of fairness in our tax structure so the middle class doesn't continue to carry the burden. We have not created a tax reform strategy that creates an opportunity for us to be more competitive in this world economy. We know that's a big piece of this, though. I'm hopeful that the joint committee made up of Democrats and Republicans will present to us a plan before Thanksgiving and that we can sit back and look at that plan and realize it is a addition, in addition to what we're doing, hopefully in the next 24 hours, is creating more fairness. But those that are out there, and I know, you know, the amazing thing about here, and I know, Madam President, you know this, this place is an unbelievable place for media. You breathe, they report it. You sneeze, they report it. And there'll be two opinions on how you sneeze. Maybe three, maybe four because that's how it works here. They feed on every word you say, everything you do. And I know some are out there bragging that this is a great deal because it just does cuts and doesn't deal with revenues. And then there's others that say it doesn't deal with revenues or it hurts Social Security. You can tell when that all occurs, that's probably not a bad plan because there's so much that people don't like of each element or there's elements they don't like. But we do need to deal with revenues at some point here. We will need to deal with a tax reform policy that brings balance and brings fairness where the middle class does not continue to be holding the bag for everything. I know there's a proposal that Senator Wyden, Senator Coates, myself have proposed. It's bipartisan. It's tax reform. Creates simplification. Creates a more com corporate competitive rate reduces the rates down for individuals, but gets rid of a pile of these loopholes, these scams and shams that people have taken advantage of so they don't have to pay their fair share for the services and the benefits we all receive in this great country. The roads we drive on, the schools we get to go to, our kids get to go to, the defense of this country, the border protection of this country, the safest food in the world. I mean, you name it, we have it. That's why we're the envy 
of every country in the world of a place to be and raise your family. But as I look at, again, this picture, and yes, I'm doing a little marketing of Alaska salmon. I would re be remiss if I didn't do that. Um, I think about Jacob's future and what he has and what his potential is. But I also think about, because as he celebrated his birthday, my father-in-law passed the same day, about his dream when he was a young man working in Connecticut. He bought a house in New Haven as he went off to Vietnam, served his country, was a colonel as he retired in the Army, and then he sold that home to buy what's in the background here, his cabin for his grandson to enjoy the fruits of his, his life and what he enjoyed of his American dream. That's what this is about. It's about making sure that this generation and the future generations can also have that American dream. That they have choices and options not restricted by politics or the financial condition of this country, but have huge opportunities. The, senators, the senator has used 10 minutes. I'd ask for an additional five minutes. Without objection. And I think about where we are today. My, my son, again, has been watching this and just because I'm not home. And, and I, uh, he has a phrase he likes to use, even though it's not the perfect deal, but it does create balance. He, he will say at times, just suck it up, buttercup. I don't know what show he saw that on, but all I know is that's his phrase. And that's what we're going to have to do here. It's not perfect. But we're going to have to do what's right for the next generation and the future generations. Madam President, we have huge opportunities and challenges ahead of us. We have an economy that needs additional work to ensure that we are creating every opportunity to create jobs in this country for everybody, no matter who you are, where you live, what age you are. We need to make sure that we continue to be the respected country that my father-in-law fought for in Vietnam, my son hopes for, we hope for, and future generations hope for. So today I come down here because I think we are close to resolving the issue that has stretched us to the, to the brink almost. And hopefully as we get beyond this, that we'll have this ability as Democrats, as Republicans, to look first as Americans, as Alaskans, as North Carolinians, wherever you're from, and focus on what's good for this country. Madam President, we'll hear more over the next 24 hours about what all the details and more of the deal. I've heard a lot of it already, but the public will learn more about it. There will be pieces we don't like. There will be pieces I'll get phone calls in my office that they don't like it. You'll get calls. But at the end of the day, we are going to do it because it's the right thing to move forward. It's going to be tough. And we'll get criticism for things we could have done. But we are where we are and we need to move forward. Madam President, as my son would say, we just got to suck it up, buttercup. I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
call the quorum be terminated? Without objection. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent the time until 6 p.m. be equally divided between the two leaders or the designees. The senators during that period of time be permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Madam President, for the information of all senators, after the House votes later today, uh, they have a one hour rule, so whenever they take it up, they'll debate it for one hour. It's my intention to try to lock in a unanimous consent agreement, set a vote, complete action on the debt limit increase. This vote could happen either tonight or tomorrow. So I want senators to be aware of that. Of course, with a consent agreement, we can uh, move any time we wish to this bill, but it would take consent. I, I think that it's pretty clear that we have, if we finish this, we have some nominations we have to deal with, and, and we have to get the FAA thing resolved. But I think this, frankly, would probably be the last vote we have that I'm aware of. And um, this has been a pretty hard work period we've had last two weekends and working late. And I think the Senate deserves to be able to go home as soon as we can. If there, if there were ever a time when we need to um, work with the, our constituents, it's now. And for me personally, I've been here for a long time. I have a home in Nevada <clears throat> that I haven't seen in months. My pomegranate trees are, I'm told, uh, blossoming and have some pomegranates on them. I have some fig trees and roses and stuff that I just haven't seen. So uh, I have constituents that I'm anxious to see, friends I need to visit with, relatives I need to w visit with. So as soon as we can complete our work, I would like to move uh, as quickly as I can to the summer recess period. Uh, so I would ask that as the House moves to this bill this afternoon, senators should use this time to come over and talk about the bill. Whether they like it or dislike it or are neutral, it would be a time that uh, they could get their remarks uh, on the record. Madam President. The Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I'm happy to be the first to take the distinguished majority leader up on his offer and be here on the floor to talk about this very important matter. Madam President, uh, I plan on, on voting no on this proposal. It's a very important matter. It's in many ways the greatest challenge we face as a nation. So I don't come to this decision lightly, but I do come to it firmly for three primary reasons. First of all, is the most important. Uh, this bill, this so-called solution, doesn't fundamentally change our spending and debt picture. It just plays around the margins. It doesn't make any big change whatsoever. To put it differently, uh, I don't want to default under any circumstances, but I don't want a downgrade of our credit rating either. And from everything the markets and the credit rating agencies, Moody's and Standard & Poor's have said for months, this would result in a downgrade. This would result in higher interest rates, first for the government and then for all of us, on our home mortgages, on our car payments, and everything else. Why? Because, again, it doesn't fundamentally change our spending and debt picture. It only cuts $7 billion in the first year and $3 billion in the second year, a total in the first two years of $10 billion. That's basically a minuscule rounding error in terms of the size of the federal budget. Over the next 10 years, we continue to mount up new debt, $7 trillion worth of new debt. So we're at 14 now. We're going to add on another $7 trillion dollars of new debt under this plan, and we do nothing to stabilize our debt to GDP ratio, which is perhaps the most important metric that economists and others point to. We need to do better. We need to have some plan to balance the budget. This plan never balances. This plan has mountains of new debt still building. This plan never stabilizes our debt to GDP ratio. So again, I don't want a default. I'll vote, vote to avoid a default, but I don't want a downgrade either that costs every American in a really meaningful way. Secondly, 
I've looked very hard at the enforcement provisions of this bill, and I'm convinced that even the meager numbers in this bill in terms of cuts are going to be blown, are going to be waived, because there is no meaningful enforcement. The only thing that it will take to bust the numbers in this bill is a new bill that passes by a simple majority in the House and by 60 votes in the Senate. And we are constantly looking at those sorts of vehicles, particularly when we're probably going to have uh, disaster appropriations and disaster bills coming to the Congress. So there are no real teeth in this bill. There is not adequate enforcement. To their credit, several members of this body, several members of the House, have spent months talking about how good, meaningful enforcement mechanisms could work. The Gang of Six had real enforcement mechanisms that they spent a lot of time on. Senators here, like Bob Corker, had meaningful enforcement mechanisms built into their proposed legislation. None of those are in this bill. Those could easily have been adopted. Those could easily have been put in the bill. They were not. And third and finally, I'm very concerned the triggers in this bill that are supposed to be there to ensure a second round of savings and deficit reduction just aren't going to work. I don't see how they're going to incent, particularly the Democrats, particularly the left, to move to a new package of savings and deficit reduction. I think rather the triggers will be triggered and we'll have unsustainable defense cuts and also unsustainable cuts to doctors and hospitals in Medicare. That's perhaps another reason, going back to point number two, that even the numbers in this bill aren't going to hold. They're going to be waived. They're going to be busted. Uh, I have to say I hope I'm wrong on all three counts if this bill, in fact, passes. Uh, but I've looked at it carefully, soberly, and that's the clear conclusion I've come to. I hope we can do better. I hope we do do better because we must for the American people because we need to start turning around our completely unsustainable spending and debt situation. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Iowa. Uh, I didn't come to the floor to comment on what Senator Vitter just said. And I can sure appreciate his view that uh, something, a decision that ends up with a $7 trillion addition to the national debt over the next 10 years uh, isn't getting us very far down the road compared to what the people of the United States who have to live within their income feel that this uh, Congress should accomplish. But uh, a $7 trillion deficit our addition to the debt over that period of time uh, compared to what the president suggested that we spend over the next 10 years uh, when he issued his budget to Congress on uh, February the 14th, we would end up with $3 trillion uh, for, uh, no, I said that wrong. We could end up with $13 uh, trillion added to the national debt. So somewhere along the line between February the 14th and last night when the President announced uh, his support for uh, this compromise, he has come to the conclusion that, uh, that we could spend $6 trillion less over the next 10 years. So uh, even though a lot of people see this as not making progress, the President admitted that he has found ways of changing his mind about six trillion dollars in the course of just a few months. I suppose it also might lead our constituents uh, to think in terms of, well, there's got to be something wrong with the thinking in Washington if on February the 14th you think we have to spend X number of dollars that will add 13 trillion dollars to the national debt, and here it is just uh, you know, three or four months since then, and the president goes on television and says this is a good compromise, 
and we can uh, be six trillion dollars less of spending. Uh, it probably leads people to believe that that uh, there's got to be a lot of money wasted in Washington, D.C. if, in fact, between February the 14th and last night, the President can find a consensus of, of spending six trillion dollars less over the next ten, ten years. Now, that's comment on what Senator Vitter just said and not disagreeing with Senator Vitter's comments in any way. Uh, when, when you're uh, here in the Senate of the United States talking about what to do about the deficit situation and how much deficit spending we're having, it probably gets lost in people's minds that what we're spending today and adding to the national debt is really creating a great legacy of debt to leave to our children and grandchildren. So this debate around this uh, issue brings me to this question. Is it fair to tax our children and grandchildren? Uh, is it fair to tax our children and grandchildren just because they can't vote? Because our children and grandchildren, for the most part, don't have any voice in this except what our generation and people representing the older generations, uh, other than our children, uh, are making these decisions. Um, because we, in fact, are doing just that, taxing our children and grandchildren by adding to the national debt. And that's what we're doing with our irresponsible budget deficits. We have a choice between a brighter future for our descendants or more social spending now. More social spending, or as President Obama might put it, uh, investments. Any way you look at it, money we spend today and we don't pay for it, we're putting this bill on future generations, our children and grandchildren. And this is a choice we should be thinking about as we uh, arrive at a decision of whether to vote for or against this grand compromise that has come out of uh, th these negotiations. And it gets down to basic choices of what do we do to encourage private sector employment. It gets down to choices of what do we do about the size of government. And there's a real choice that comes in this debate. As you talk about how big government should be, the choice is do we grow government or do we grow the private sector? And then what is the philosophical differences as well as the economic differences between growing government versus allowing business and entrepreneurship to flourish in America? And we've had these dramatic increases in expenditures over just the last two years. 22% increases in appropriations in the last two years when the economy only grows at about 2%. Everybody knows that's not sustainable. And on top of that, we had an $814 billion stimulus package that didn't do what it was supposed to do to keep employment, uh, unemployment under 8%. And, uh, and in this period of time, we've gone from the gross, uh, the debt, national debt, being 35 percent of the gross national product, today to be about 65 percent. Before the end of this year, it's going to be 72 percent, and it's on a path to go to 90 percent. And so we have seen government grow during these last few years out of proportion to the 20 percent of the gross national product that the public sector represented by the federal government took compared to that growth now from 20 percent to now 24 percent, 25 percent. Now, those five percentage points of growth in the government may not seem like a lot, but just look at the difference between incentives for growth 
of the private sector creating wealth as opposed to the government consuming wealth. Uh, and that is a fact. You know, government consumes wealth. Government doesn't cre create wealth. People that are using their labor and their mind and investing are the ones that create wealth in our country. Those five percentage points make a difference because it's a very dramatic growth in government. And as growth, as government consumes more, and I said it doesn't create wealth, it takes money out of the private sector where it can grow more and create jobs and consequently then limits the opportunity for expanding the economic pie so that the, and that's what the private sector does through investment and labor, expand the economic pie so we can have economic growth, so we can have more for more people. But when government gets bigger, you restrict the opportunities for economic growth in the private sector and you have less for more people. So five percentage points growth of the government in just the last two years compared to a 50-year average lessens the chance for a brighter future for our children and grandchildren, and that's got to be a part of this debate as we decide the size of government versus the size of the private sector, the wealth-producing private sector. If you keep government at 20%, that's investment then uh, that's going to be more in the private sector that's going to create wealth. It's going to be a more productive use of our resources. The promise of our free market system can only be realized if we choose less social spending, less intrusive regulation, and more efficient use of our resources in the private sector as opposed to the public sector. So we should be doing things not only in this budget agreement, this deficit reduction agreement, but in all of the decisions we make here in the Congress of the United States, we should be doing more to encourage productive uses of our resources in the private sector rather than the expenditures of those resources in the public sector. Now just in case I said that wrong, I want to repeat it. We need to be encouraging more uses of productive resources in the private sector as opposed to the consumption of those resources uh, in the uh, public sector. Obama, President Obama has launched a campaign over the 30 months he's been in office to defend the welfare state and of course the woefully inefficient government-run health care system that is an example of that welfare state. And I think we can learn some lessons from the rest of the world as well in looking at what's right for America. We should learn from history and not repeat the mistakes that have been made in other countries. <clears throat> Since the 1950s, we've seen a lot of countries around the world use the transfers of wealth from one generation to another, or the transfer of wealth from one group of people to another. We've seen grants. We've seen a redistributive uh, philosophy in a lot of countries. And what did that do? It did very little to raise the living standards of those in Asia, Latin America, Africa. But more open economies have proven otherwise and more open economies like we've had in Japan since the 1950s have lifted more people out of poverty in 10 years than welfare state programs have done in 50 years. Japan, just using it as an example, forced its producers way back 50, 60 years ago to compete. Private sector used resources are more productive than those of the public sector making the decisions on how to use those resources, or a command economy, as you might call it. After Japan, we had Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, 
And more recently, in the last 20 years, China and India go, uh, uh, encouraging more competition and more productive uses of research, resources, less of it promoted by the government, more decisions made to the private sector. Eventually, even Brazil now and even parts of Africa now are learning that that's the route to go. We should learn from that. We shouldn't turn backwards and rely more on government than we have in the past, because doing that, we retard opportunity in America. You retard opportunity by growing government at the expense of individual initiative. I hope that we don't go that route. And I think this budget debate has something to do with whether or not we're going to turn, uh, the, uh, turn this around from the direction that it's taken over the last few years. And those last few years has not just been the 30 months of this presidency, but a little bit going back into the previous presidency as well. In regard to uh, in regard to the, uh, uh, the President Obama's programs, we've had few results from the government becoming more involved in the economy. We've dealt with near zero interest rates for a long period of time. I've already mentioned the $814 billion stimulus. And there's other things that, uh, that have been done in recent months to turn this economy around. Uh, and we still have unemployment above 9 percent. The recovery that was supposed to come from all of these uh, uh, programs that have had greater government involvement in our economy uh, have made a recovery very, very elusive. In fact, there's even questions in the recent media of two weeks of whether or not we could even be going into another recession. Yes, President Obama tried mightily and wastefully uh, and in the end very ineffectually to turn this economy around through a massive number of government programs, but it hasn't worked. Progress would have been greater if we'd tried uh, programs by President Reagan or even President Kennedy's policies. Because in both of those instances, they cut marginal tax rates, they eliminated burdensome regulations, and instead, what do we have out there right now, even today, coming from the White House? Promises yet of higher taxes, almost a demand that Congress pass higher taxes right now, more regulations. Just recently read about a business person saying that out of EPA, 29 onerous regulations are coming out that's going to be detrimental to job creation because they're so costly. Or another way of putting it is it might uh, lead uh, or uh, cause business people to, uh, to worry about the uncertainty of what government's going to do. And when you have that uncertainty, uh, and right now there is a heightened uncertainty, it retards growth. It retards growth because people won't invest and when there is an increased investment and hiring there's less productivity and what uh, and what these uh, issues are all about is creating jobs and we are not creating jobs right now and that's really what people are going to see as a test of whether or not we're out of a recession regardless of what uh, economists uh, that are leading economists that make the decision we've been out of a recession now for two months for people that are unemployed it's not a recession it's a depression uh, and they're going to measure coming out of a recession or coming out of their depression whether or not they have a job and jobs aren't being created now President Obama promises what he wants is something that's fair and balanced. And when I hear him talking about fair and balanced, I wonder if he's really trying to steal those words from Fox News. Why is it fair to distribute more welfare to the present generation and today's voters 
by growing government at the expense of wealth creating private sector at harm to our children and our grandchildren who are going to end up paying for it with less productive uses of the resources of this country. We should not be thinking as Europe has thought about growing government, having government consume more of the resources uh, of the economy, leaving less to individuals to make decisions whether to save or spend and what to save and what to spend on. That's the way it's done in Europe. We shouldn't go that way. And uh, I always use uh, a statistic that may seem very small to be insignificant, but I use a statistic of 1% because if you compare the United States with Europe over the last uh, 25 years, our growth have averaged about 1% more in the United States than what it does in Europe. Now that 1% may not sound like very much, right? However, over a generation, just 1% difference in growth because be, uh, between one economy of Europe and the economy of the United States adds up to 20, over a, after a generation, up to 25% differential in per capita income. So it seems to me the issues of this debt reduction debate, or if you want to call it the increasing the deficit ceiling, borrowing capacity of the federal government, too often it tends to be about what is the situation right now. But it's really a debate about what is fair for our children and grandchildren, because those are the decisions on borrowing that we're making today. And I have to say where I started out with a question of whether or not it's fair for us to tax future generations for the borrowing that we're doing today and simply say it isn't fair to tax future generations just because they can't vote. I yield the floor. So, uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. President, I wanted to say a few words uh, to my fellow Vermonters and to anyone else who might be interested as to, well, as to why I will be voting against uh, this deficit reduction package uh, when it comes to the floor. Uh, and the reason is pretty simple. This deficit reduction package is grotesquely unfair and it is also bad economic policy. It should not be passed. Mr. President, the wealthiest people in this country 
and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. Uh, in a recent 25-year period, 80% of all new income created in America went to the top 1% who now earn more income than the bottom 50%. In terms of wealth, the United States has the most unequal distribution of wealth of any major country on earth, with the top 400 people owning more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans. And when we talk about this deficit reduction package, with the richest people becoming richer, huge corporations making billions of dollars in profits, and in some cases paying nothing in taxes, how much are those people, the wealthy and the powerful, asked to contribute toward deficit reduction and shared sacrifice? How much are the rich and the powerful going to contribute into this deficit reduction package? And the answer is zero, not one cent. Meanwhile, as everybody in America knows, we are in the midst of a horrendous recession. Real unemployment is over 16 percent. People have lost their homes, their life savings. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. And yet this deficit reduction package, package comes down on those people the working families, the low-income people, the sick, the elderly, the children. Rich pay nothing, large corporations pay nothing, and yet working families and the most vulnerable people in this country are going to be shouldering the burden of deficit reduction on their shoulders. That is immoral, that is wrong, that is bad economic policy. Now, Mr. President, as you well know, this is a complicated package, and nobody can predict with any certainty exactly what programs will be cut and how much they will be cut, because the process will kick in to the appropriations committees here all over the House and the Senate, and they will go to a super committee who will make very significant decisions. So nobody with certainty can tell you exactly what programs will be cut. But what we can say is that we are looking to up to $1.4 trillion in cuts and virtually every program, every program that working families depend upon, that our children depend upon, that the sick depend upon, are on the line. Now, in my state, for example, it gets cold. We have a beautiful state, and we love our winters, but it gets cold. It gets 10 below zero, 20 below zero. And many people in my state, including senior citizens, desperately need a program called LIHEAP, the Low Income Heating Energy Assistance Program, which provides help to many people, including a lot of seniors, in staying warm when it gets 20 below zero. I fear very much that there will be major cuts in that program. In our state, we have done very, very well in expanding community health centers. We've got over 110,000 people are now accessing new community health centers, finally being able to go to a doctor and a dentist when they need it. I'm going to do everything that I can to prevent those cuts. I fear that those programs can be cut. In Vermont, in Connecticut, all over this country, we have a major crisis in child care. Families want to get into the Head Start program. They want affordable child care. Those programs will be cut. In my state, we have a program that helps struggling dairy farmers, a program called the Milk Program. It helps them stay in business. I fear very much, and I'm going to fight against this, I fear that that program will be cut. We have young people today from working class families hoping upon hope 
that maybe they will be able to afford to go to college. Well, we can expect major cuts in Pell Grants and other programs that make college affordable for our young people. In this country, we have people who are going hungry. We did a study recently, more hunger among seniors. Some of those programs will be cut. Affordable housing programs will be cut. So let us not kid ourselves. In the midst of a terrible recession, when so many people are hurting, so many people are struggling just to keep their heads above water economically, this deficit reduction package is going to slap them at the side of the head and make life much more difficult for them. Now, Mr. President, as you well know, this is a two-part program. And the first part calls for approximately $900 billion in cuts. And the second part calls for about $1.2 to $1.5 trillion in cuts. And here's where it gets a little bit complicated. Because a super committee made up of six Democrats, six Republicans, will have the opportunity to look at everything. As the majority leader said, everything is on the table. Now, what does that mean? If everything is on the table, Social Security is on the table. And what we have heard from our Republican friends, what we've heard from some Democratic friends, what we've heard from the President of the United States, is that maybe we should adopt a so-called chain CPI, which will result in very significant cuts in Social Security benefits. If you're 65 now and that program is implemented, when you are 75, you're going to lose $560 a year. 20 years from now, when you're 85, you're going to lose $1,000 a year. Am I saying that definitely will happen? No, I'm not. Social Security will be on the table. Medicare will be on the table. Medicaid will be on the table. Everything will be on the table. If that committee ends up not coming to a decision, if they end up being deadlocked, say, 6-6, six, six, then we go to a sequestration program and more cuts are being made. So I would say, Mr. President, that when poll after poll after poll suggests very strongly that the American people want shared sacrifice. A poll just came out last week. Washington Post, 72% of the people polled said that they believe that folks making more than $250,000 a year should pay more in taxes in order to help us with deficit reduction. Poll after poll says that it is absurd that large corporations get incredible loopholes which enable them to make billions in profits and not pay one nickel in taxes. So, Mr. President, this is a bad proposal. This is an unfair proposal. We can do better, and we must do better. And I do not intend to vote for a deficit reduction package where the sacrifices are being made by people in the middle class and working class who are already hurting. It is time for the big money interest to stop remembering they are also Americans and they should contribute to deficit reduction. With that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor and note the absence of the quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
representative from Georgia. Mr. President, I ask that quorum call be terminated.